to kind of emphasize also, which I'm going to come to at the end of my presentation, what we could do together, referring to what you said, Sadia, about how we can speak about the conflict and what we could do together in partnership, actually. Uh, I'll share my screen. Can I, can you make me a co-host, please? Okay. So let me just So as you said, um yes, um just a little anecdote on yes, I did pharmacy and then I moved to the UK because I really wanted to be involved in um Sadi, are you managing the chat book so I don't need to deal with it? Please, yeah. Um, so uh, I did I did do, um, I'm, I'm glad I did pharmacy actually before I did foreign policy and diplomacy because I have this uh, idea that if, I, if, if diplomacy doesn't work, then I can always go back to pharmacy and help with some medications with our leaders. So I'm, I'm glad I did it that way and not the other way around. As to um, um, Palestinian nationalism, I don't know if I can do justice by, um, by presenting it within 20 minutes, but I'll try my best. Um, when we talk about nationalism or national movement in general, we often speak about history and historic events. And in my talk, I would like to point out three more factors that besides history that actually have played a role in um, the involvement of Palestinian uh, nationalism. And those are terminology, geography, and culture. So in general, scholarship refers to two types of nationalism. One is the civic territorial where a common territory or citizenship is the one that's responsible for uh, the creation of a nation. And a clear example are, uh, is uh, France, Great Britain, and the United States. And there is also the ethnic nationalism where the shared values, ethnicities, uh, ethnicity, language, and culture, besides historic heritage, are the ones to uh, create uh, a nation. So in the first case, in the civic, you, in other words, you may say it's the, the state that makes the people. And in the second case, it's the people that make the state. Now, there are different arguments and claims about what is, what is it in the case of Palestinian nationalism. So some may say that since the Palestinians, which are today the Palestinian people, have remained constant uh, in, in, in the specific territory we are speaking about, then the, it's more suitable to talk about the, the territorial nationalism. Uh, you may agree or disagree with that. We'll come to it in the discussion. And with regard to ethnic nationalism, I mean, some may claim that in the case of the Jewish people, having come from different regions around the world, uh, sharing values, ethnicities, language, uh, cul uh, cu and culture, um, to create a home uh, a home uh, in Palestine, then maybe ethnic nationalism is suitable to describe that. Again, you may agree or disagree. I want to come back to um, um, to terminology, starting with terminology out of the four factors of for those who claim that uh, Palestinian nationalism may have been only a reaction to Zionism, um, you may find uh, the mentioning, the first early mentioning of Palestine and Palestinians in the uh, second part of the 19th century uh, by Palestinian intellectuals in the bigger Levant region that have started to talk about Palestine, Palestinians. One of them was Khalil Baydas in 1898 that actually mentioned uh, Palestine, Palestinians in the preface of a book that he translated from a Russian to Arabic. 
and where he described the uh, uh, where the Palestinian peasants are being described, uh, some trace the first mentioning of the first Arab mentioning of the term Palestinian to George Kassab, who was also uh, uh, an intellectual and a uh, Christian uh, uh, intellectual based in Beirut, where he in 1909 in his book uh, uh, used the term Palestine and Palestinian Palestini. And as Rashid Khalidi mentions in his book, even though Palestine, and that refers to what I tried to say earlier, which kind of nationalism defines Palestinian nationalism, even though Palestinians or Palestine were uh, um, conquered by many different uh, nations uh, through time, through history, the population remained constant and is still uh, now called the Palestinians. So the, what, this, what I'm trying to show is that the terminology about Palestine and Palestinian started early on uh, and the root of the Palestinian nationalism is not actually uh, a response to Zionism, but it was the intellectual renaissance in the 19th century, where intellectuals talking about uh, um, uh, Palestinian identity as a distinct one from the bigger Levant uh, 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 Syrian um, um, identity. Now, before 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 sykes picot which I'm going to come to in a moment when I uh, touch on history, um, Rashid Khaldi does uh, go and unpack the way Palestinian identity was never an exclusive one uh, and uh, during the Ottoman uh, era. And people used to actually describe themselves by, by Arab affiliation, by religious affiliation, and by belonging to a region. Uh, a small region within the bigger one. For example, you could say, I am Arab Muslim Haifawi from Haifa, or Nabulsi from Nablus, or Yafawi from Jaffa. Uh, but it's exactly that intellectual uh, um, this debate among uh, Palestinian intellectuals like uh, Khalil Sakakini, who contributed very much to it, um, that made that distinction between a Palestinian identity and a bigger uh, pan-Syrian identity. Now, yes, uh, Zionism did play a role, uh, and it's, it is to be acknowledged in, in shaping the Palestinian identity, but it would be a mistake to say that Palestinian identity emerged mainly as response to Zionism. And that's what uh, Rashid Khalidi unpacks really well in his book, uh, Palestinian Identity. Um, and later on, and actually points out that later on, there was an interwining of the Palestinian narrative with the Jewish narrative, and each were defining uh, uh, oneself in terms of uh, the other. So Zionism played a role, but it, it wasn't the main reason why Palestinian nationalism emerged. Another important distinction that Professor Asad Ghanim uh, makes is that the, how the, the lines drawn by Sykes Picot in 1916 actually have uh, helped the, um, the reinforcement of Palestinian national consciousness uh, as a separate one from uh, uh, the, the pan Syrian one. And this is where history uh, plays a role. So, 1916, the sykes picot agreement, the lines were, were drawn to allow the British mandate, the French, the French ma mandate, and the uh, territories um, under Russian control. So these three, these three powers were trying to advance their imperial ambition, but of course, to the uh, uh, discontent of the indigenous people who were, were thinking about how to uh, advance their nationalism, especially that they were feeling distinct uh, linguistically, uh, being Arab, not Turks, speaking Arabic, and, uh, and the Christians also played a major role because they were not Muslims uh, that could easily be part of the Turkish uh, Muslim um, identity. So, 
history did play a role, but history was not also, history was driven by other factors. So one of the factors that really played a major role and, and we tend to forget to mention that was the geography. Uh, when Britain and France wanted to, to uh, divide the region between them, they actually cho chose the Fertile Crescent area, which is a very fertile land. And you see, as you see, it's green. And Britain made sure that it has access to waters uh, through Haifa in Palestine and made sure that it has access to the oil fields of Iraq. So geography did matter in the way Sykes-Picot divided the region between Britain and France. Uh, a fourth factor is the culture. And um, in, in this case, I think culture was uh, a barrier rather than a uh, um, uh, factor that helped the involvement of uh, Palestinian nationalism. I'll say why. While British duplicity allowed Britain to promise uh, Palestine uh, for the Jews as a homeland, to promise um, the Arabs, uh, Arab independence from the, the Ottoman Empire if they helped by revolting against it. Uh, it did hold secret talks with the French and, and, and the Russians and, and divided the, the region uh, according to Sykes-Picot. But where culture, where I refer to culture here is that the Sharif of Mecca, Sharif Hussein, who credentials as coming from the family of Prophet uh, Muhammad and uh, being the family that is custodian for the holy Islamic places, uh, his, his, uh, he was seen as potential uh, uh, leader and the, the correspondence of the high commissioner, the British high commissioner was with him about possible Arab uh, independence if they help against the Ottoman Empire. What he, what he did is that he believed that the British promise is gonna deliver. And that's my question about the culture. If there was some kind of naivety, if there, if there was a naive or laid back approach on the Arab side of if, if the British promised us, then they're gonna deliver and that's it. Uh, and if and the question if if there could have been if there were actions of advocacy or or that could have been done that were not done to ensure that what promised is delivered now it is a positive part in the arab culture that if you promise you that's it you, your word is respected and is to be honored it's it's positive in that sense perception wise but it didn't mature to deliver. So I, I have a question about how much uh, a nation should be laid back about it. Now, despite these three events, yeah, and the rising uh, concerns of the Arabs about are they gonna have independence or not, the national groups evolving in Palestine did, did, did not stop. Actually, there were more and more um, um, uh, groups and bodies, political bodies that were established. For example, the Muslim Christian Association that was established, it was a very direct reaction to the celebrations held in Jerusalem on 2nd November 1918 to celebrate the first anniversary of Balfour. And, and there was a, a, a growing uh, concern about uh, the rising number of Zionist settlements, of, of uh, Jewish settlements within Palestine, and then the celebration itself brought that to, brought the concern to be even uh, bigger. So, but still, there were all those structures and institutions and activity uh, in order to advance Palestinian nationalism. Now, the British government selling lands to uh, uh, Jewish agencies and um, has contributed to the resistance of the Palestinians to the Zionist settlement. And I mean, it, it, it can be understood um, um, 
I mean, people who are losing the land that they were uh, holding or uh, owning a while ago, it felt um, with more and more um, uh, um, land owned by by Jews, there was more fear of what what is happening. Really, Jewish National Fund um, uh, and uh, private people owned about 8% uh, of the land after three decades. So that was a very quick uh, purchase of land. David Ben-Gurion the, uh, said in 1937 about that, that it's in Hebrew, so I'm going to translate this. Uh, we need to see the situation as it is. On the security front, we are the ones who are attacked and on the defense. But on the political ground, we are the offenders and the Arabs are defending themselves. They are inhabiting the land and holding the, the land and we are sitting in exile and we just want to make Aliyah, which is move to Israel and purchase the land from them. So he was aware of that. Within what was happening within the Palestinian uh, um, side, meanwhile, that was, uh, Despite the, the, the diligent activity of, of establishing more bodies, political bodies and, and representative bodies to advance Palestinian nationalism, there was the internal competition over political dominance of two major um, families, Husseini and Nashashibi, which I think in my, in my eyes, it did weaken or uh, slow down the, the process of uh, Palest Palestinian nationalism, the process of emergence of Palestinian nationalism, but it was uh, part of the dynamics, so it, it was there. It's good to acknowledge it. Um, so according to Rashid Khalidi, actually the, the years, the crucial years of um, the formation of Palestinian identity were between 1917 to 1923. Um, um, the, there definitely was the 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 region where uh, um, you had a population constant on on a specific uh, uh, piece of land within the bigger Levant, and there's also the shared values, ethnicity, language, and culture, and historic heritage. Uh, so again, you could argue with which kind of nationalism is the best suitable to describe the Palestinian nationalism, or you could say both together. And the ethnic and the civic, uh, but what I want to what what uh, was seen that but before 1948 actually the currency the newspapers the institutions and the cultural events all were expression of Palestinian nationalism that was uh, maturing on the ground. Um, later on and till today, the Palestinian and the Israeli Jewish I mean the Palestinian and the Zionist more accurately narratives are um, competing they are in tension uh, with one another and um, I think the tension reveals um, I mean as narratives do narratives sometimes are the product of political projects but they are also sometimes they feed into political projects and 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 uh, uh, promote them so um, the the tension between the narratives express or, or yield the the competing political agendas or projects of both nations one word on oslo the oslo accords are seen as a major uh, weakening uh, point in the in, in the history of palestinian nationalism and till today scholars write about it and palestinian leaders discuss how oslo accords what they did is they actually made out of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which was a liberation movement that seeks Palestinian uh, self-determination, that was transferred, made a, a, a kind of transferred to Palestinian Authority, which is an entity that gives services. And that's a huge downgrade from being a, a, an organization that uh, still calls for a self-determination or of a nation to you know, having a uh, security operation with the Israeli side, giving some services. So also seen as uh, disastrous in, in the eyes of many Palestinians. 
And it, it, as a fact, a matter of fact, today, after 25 years, we, there's still no Palestinian state and Oslo was meant to establish a Palestinian state. So there's a lot of, uh, of anger and despair and questioning about what Oslo brought. Uh, today, where we are at with annexation, um, the Palestinians are feeling that even the viability of the two-state two solution is at question because if Israel goes ahead and annexes the 30% of the area C in the West Bank, uh, what does that mean for the Palestinian national project? Is there going to be a state or not? Where is it going to be? How is it going to be? What about the Palestinian people who are in this area? Do they become enclaves? Do they become infiltrators for their own lands? What, what is their legal status? What about their farming lands? Um, so there's a big question. I, I myself started questioning if we can see a Palestinian state established in the foreseen uh, future. Um, and I'm not very optimistic about it as long as uh, the prime minister in Israel is Benjamin Netanyahu. And that, that brings me to the last one of what we could do and what the younger generation could do. Uh, I, think the, I think my belief is in the younger generation. Um, so the Palestinian citizens of Israel with the Israeli Jews together, the way the voting pattern uh, during elections, the, the, what we do together as establishing a new political party and how, how we influence politics and decision making in Israel to push us for the negotiating table. Uh, and what about the, and also the Palestinian young diaspora with the British Jewry uh, or American Jewry and how the younger generation through its universal values could also really push for justice either through advocacy here or through putting pressure uh, through, for example, for the Jewish community uh, to put pressure on the Israeli government, for example, not to annex. I'm aware that there might be limitations, but I think that's where we are, where the hopes that are left besides the international law, uh, like the ICC kind of putting pressure on Israel if it investigates uh, the Gaza wars. Uh, so not very optimistic, but still the younger generation is the, the source of hope. That's it. I think so. It started at three o'clock. See, now they can see us. They can't see you, but they. Hi, uh, thanks, Sana. Sorry, it took me a while to unmute myself just then. Um, thank you very much. That was, um, I know, very difficult to put into 15, 20 minutes, and I'm sure there's lots of questions. Um, but before we do go into questions, I'm going to hand it over to Robin. And I think Warren will be able to unmute War uh, Robin, or Robin can probably do it himself. Yeah, no, I can, I can do it myself. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Warren, I think there's also maybe an issue with the chat facility. I know one or two people have kind of contacted saying that it's not working, so if we can have a look at that. Um, whilst I am looking at the moment, I'm not sure why. Brilliant. So I will um, introduce Robin, if that's okay. Um, Robin Moss is the Director of uh, Strategy for UJIA, um, leading UJIA's Israel educational work. Um, he grew up in the LJY Netzer, is a graduate of New College University of Oxford. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, so I'm sure you can um, um, let people know how that is uh, pronounced. has been at UJIA for eight and a half years. He is one of the UK's Jewish um, leading Israel educators, um, sorry, Jewish communities leading Israel educators, and you have traveled to many places to um, educate people on um, about Israel. So I'm sure you can add to that, Robin, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. No, thank you, and it's uh, really nice to spend uh, uh, an hour and a bit with you this afternoon, and um, obviously from the uh, delightful perch of uh, my own bedroom. Uh, as is uh, the nature of these things today. Um, so I've been asked to say something about Zionism. What is Zionism? What was Zionism? Um, and I'll, I'll spend about 15 minutes giving some thoughts about it. And then really, you know, you've heard Sana's presentation as well. And I think, you know, the most valuable piece of this is the dialogue and the discourse and the, the questions. Um, 
but I'll just give some overall thoughts about Zionism. I want to start with, with um, a, a very simple game. Um, I grew up in a youth movement and we love games. So the game is as follows, and, and normally if we were in person, we could do this interactively, it's a bit awkward on Zoom, so maybe I'll just narrate the game to you. So imagine that I'm writing up on a chalkboard three words, fruit, vegetable, and mineral. Okay, fruit, vegetable, mineral. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to shout out words and you have to decide which category they go in. Okay, so I'm gonna start with orange. Okay, and probably most of you are gonna write down it's gonna be in fruit, okay. Uh, salt, okay, then mineral, okay, fine. Lettuce, vegetable, tomato. Oh, now the smart Alex here are gonna be like, oh, that's actually technically a fruit, but we kind of think of it as a vegetable. Or maybe I can put it in between. And depending, I suppose, on whether we're talking colloquially, um, as in which section of the supermarket it's in, or if we're talking biologically, maybe you would have some dispute. Okay, so that's round one. We've had oranges, lettuces, salt, and tomatoes. Round two, three new categories, religion, nation, and culture, okay? Now, the fir our first word that we're gonna throw out there is Christianity. Okay, and now I think most people, most people, I don't wanna impose on anyone else's identity, but most people between religion, nation, and culture, okay, we'll put Christianity as in religion. Um, let's do Brazilian. Now, clearly there is a Brazilian culture, but if you're talking about someone who is a Brazilian, I think probably nation, you know, nation, Brazilian. And again, as Sana said, like it's a bit complicated because actually Brazil, Brazilian nationhood, Brazilian nationalism is uh, a kind of colonial and post-colonial idea and incorporates many different ethnic groups. And it's, uh, you know, there's lots of complexity, which of course we can unpack. But broadly, if we had to pick one of those three, probably we'd pick nation. Then if I said, uh, you know, um, Scandinavian culture or something like that. You know, what's the culture of Scandinavia? Again, there's like, you know, it's a bit slippery, a bit tricky, but it's definitely not a religion, although maybe it has religious elements. It's definitely not a nation because Scandinavians is not one nation. It's, you know, lots of different ones. Probably that's going to go in a culture. And then maybe you can see where I'm going here, but then our final word is Judaism or the Jewish people or the Jews, which category religion nation culture does judaism go in now i went to school in the uk and at my school we went i well actually at my primary school i went to a very christian primary school where we had a we had a lesson called scripture i don't know if anyone else has scripture when they're growing up i think today it's called rs or re religious education religious studies and that's where i learned about judaism at school Typically, the way that we frame Judaism is it's a religion like Christianity or Islam or Hinduism or, or whatever. Like, and, it has, and you learn about it as it has a set of beliefs and a set of values and a set of holy days and feast days and fast days. And you go, oh, isn't that nice? You know, Judaism has a festival of light at, in the winter. So does Hinduism and so does Christianity. And isn't that lovely? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and, and that, I think, is at least partially a function of the fact that we have this thing called religious studies. We don't necessarily have national studies or cultural studies, so not kind of primary or secondary school. But actually, Judaism doesn't always fit very comfortably under the banner of religion. To start with, the single biggest, like largest group of Jews in the world, you just take the whole Jewish people around the world and you ask them, like, what's, you know, are you religious? Are you, a, you know, what, how would you self-define? The largest single group of Jews in the world would say they're secular. Now, what does secular mean? Well, here's, by the way, an interesting, let, we're not gonna go down this blind alley, but I just present this to you as an interesting thought. Can you define the word secular without using the words not religious? Or is secular just defined as not religious, if you see what I mean? There are many wonderful projects, are just, you know, in Israel, for example, there's a thing called the secular yeshiva. A yeshiva is a traditional religious form of study, you know, an intensive Jewish, um, where you study Jewish text. The secular yeshiva is an attempt to reimagine, rejuvenate, reclaim Jewish textual tradition from the mantle of religion. And they would say, we are trying to understand the word secular in a way that doesn't mean religious. But regardless of whether you think, well, how you're gonna define secular, the bare fact is that a significant proportion of the Jewish people self-define as secular. I'm not, you know, I'm not part of a religion, or maybe there is a thing called the Jewish religion, but I'm Jewish, I'm not part of the Jewish religion. So it doesn't neatly fit there. 
a nation, well, again, it depends exactly how you define a nation, but Judaism has, has existed for 2,000 years as a, tran a global people. There are Jews in almost every country in the world. And I am British. I might be Jewish as well, but I'm, I'm British. I'm part of the British nation. And at least in many cases, in many understandings of nationhood, so if you read Benedict Anderson, for example, Imagine Community, probably the most influential work on nationalism in the 20th century, he says that one of the um, kind of uh, markers of nationhood is that nations have boundaries, that no nation claims or wants every member of humanity to be a part of it. There are some religions that, that would like universal salvation, that in the ideal world, in some imagined ideal world, everyone would be uh, you know, under one creed or under one God or whatever you want to believe. But no nation wants that. They, they, yeah, nations understand there are other nations beyond their boundaries. And whether you can truly be a part of two nations, I, I don't know. Again, I don't want to impose on anyone. Some people would say yes, some people would say no. But again, Judaism is, is complicated because it definitely, you know, it definitely has some national aspect, and we'll come on to that more in a minute. But it's clearly not purely a nation. And then a culture, well, again, there clearly is Jewish culture. There is culture produced by Jews. There's culture around Jews. But Judaism is more than just a culture. I say just, there's nothing wrong with being a culture. But Judaism is, is far more than the sum of its cultural parts. Um, there are, and this argument about what is the nature of Judaism, in many ways, is one of the reasons why Zionism has proven to be so complicated for many people to understand. Why well, I would argue it's one of the most misunderstood and uh, words that is kind of thrown around in, in, in the English language. Uh, and I think partly it's because it's not exactly clear what the claim of Zionism is, or sometimes it's not clear what the claim of Zionism is. However, I'm going to make that classic uh, um, bold prediction. I'm going to say actually the claim of Zionism is actually very simple. And actually in it, the, the complexity and what does Zionism mean and what does Zionism mean today? Actually, I'm going to say Zionism means one thing and one thing only, and it's one sentence and it's very simple. I'm going to also then do the annoying thing of caveating it a bit, but let's start with what it is. Zionism is the belief that there should be a Jewish state in the land of Israel. So what, are, so what does that mean? There should be a Jewish state in the land of Israel. Let's start with those, what, what do those two things mean? Well, first of all, in the early days of Zionism, there were some people who called themselves Zionists who imagined a, a Jewish future that was not a state. So they imagined a Jewish, large Jewish community in the land of Israel or Palestine or the ancient, or the ancient Near East or whatever we want to call it. I'm just going to call it the land of Israel for the moment because historically it's useful to understand it in that way, but I don't want to delegitimize other people's words. So there were some people, for example, a famous Zionist called Ahad Ha'am, who was, literally means one of the people, it's a pen name, his actual name was Asher Ginsberg. By the way, interesting fact about Ahad Ha'am, Asher Ginsberg, he lived in London for a period. The reason he lived in London is he was dispatched from Odessa, where he grew up, by the Wisotsky Tea Company, which is a tea company, to be, to open their Western European operation, which was headquartered in London, and you can still to this day go in Bermondsey to the headquarters of the Wazotsky Tea Company, where Ahad Ha'am um, was the managing director for a while. Uh, by all accounts, by the way, he rather hated his time in London. He didn't like London life very much, but that's a by the by. Anyway, Ahad Ha'am talked about, he said, I'm not sure a state is necessarily the way to go. Maybe we, should, we just need to form some kind of large enough community in the land of Israel so that Jewish creativity can be unleashed. That was his vision. However, I think it's fair to say today that basically all Zionists, all people who would claim they are Zionists, would, would hold to the Jewish state bit. They would say there, are, there is no other model in the modern world that guarantees security, that guarantees sufficient levels of national self-liberation, self-independence, and you know, the, the model that the world has adopted of how national communities um, um, organize themselves is through self-determination and statehood. Uh, again, there are, of course, exceptions to that. So in New Zealand, for example, the Maori exist as New Zealand people. They're part of the nation of New Zealand, but they have 
significant levels of cultural autonomy and there have been various attempts to reconcile with their past and so on and so forth. And there are other examples like that, but largely they are few and far between. The vast majority of peoples in the world who consider themselves to have a national identity either have a country, a state, or seek to have one. And Zionism before the state was the movement that sought to create the state. So that's something about Jewish state. In terms of the land of Israel, again, in the early days of Zionism, we're talking the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century, there were Zionists who explored the possibility, at least theoretically, and to a very limited uh, uh, extent practically, that maybe this Jewish state could exist somewhere else, not in the land of Israel. So most famously, there was a scheme called the Uganda scheme, which Herzl was kind of interested in, Theodore Herzl, probably the leading Zion, uh, early political Zionist, was kind of interested in a little bit in the early 20th century. It's called the Uganda scheme. Again, classic British colonialism, the actual bit today of where it would have been would have been northern Kenya, but Kenya hadn't been, Britain hadn't allowed Kenya to come into existence yet. So it was called the Uganda scheme. Um, and there were others who looked at some parts of Canada and in Australia and in East, uh, Eastern Siberia and some other places. In practice, none of those schemes ever got very far. And again, today, the Jewish state is in the land of Israel. That's where it was established in 1948. But there were some who imagined it could be somewhere else, but pretty much those options turned out to be non-viable for whatever reason, and therefore, you know, it ended up being in the land of Israel. So those are two caveats. But the other reason that it's a useful definition that Zionism is the belief there should be a Jewish state in the land of Israel is it also reveals the two central schisms in Zionism historically and still today. So the first is, what do we, what's Jewish about a Jewish state? What do we mean by a Jewish state? By the way, you could ask the same question. What makes France French? What makes Albania Albanian? What makes the UK British? Now, these things are not simple matters, but some of the things that people have said in terms of what makes a Jewish state, some people say it's purely a matter of being a majority, being that Jews should be the majority, which was for, for the simple reason that under democratic forms of government, majority means that you can be assured of continued self-determination, that if you're a majority, you form the majority of the body politic, and therefore you can be assured that, and we'll come on to why Zionism turned out to be an attractive proposition for Jews in a minute, but you can be assured that you can have con continuation. Some people say, no, a Jewish state means a place where Jewish culture is is normalized. So where Hebrew is the language of the public square, along with Arabic or Spanish or French or English or other languages that people might go there. Of course, especially Arabic, which is the first language of 20% of the population, including of Sana herself, um, as, as a citizen of the state of Israel. Um, about the calendar, that in Israel, the standard work week is Sunday to Thursday, not Monday to Friday. Why? Well, in the Jewish in the Jewish culture or religion or nation, whatever you want, to, whatever this thing called Judaism is, Friday is Shabbat. And therefore it makes sense for the weekend to be aligned with that. That instead of the 25th of December being a national holiday, it would be Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur or Sukkot or Shavuot or the other, what are called the Chagim, the Jewish traditionally religious holidays, which have become Israeli national holidays. For most Israelis, those days are not really about religion per se. They've become part of the national culture, by the way, in a similar way that for most British people, rightly or wrongly, today, Easter Sunday is not imbued with deep religious meaning. It's become part of British culture that we have a long weekend uh, in the spring that coincides with Easter. And still others said that what it means to be a Jewish state is something to do with, let's say, Jewish values or um, the living out of the prophetic ideals of Judaism, or, or other, other ideas such as that. So what does a Jewish state mean is not exactly clear, and many different Zionists, the Zionism itself doesn't have a clear answer. And many of the internal issues within Israel and the Israeli society today are essentially um, culture wars about that very question. What does it mean to be a Jewish state? So for example, should public transport run on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, is a major 
question in Israel because it fundamentally comes back to what does it mean to have a Jewish state. If we go to the second bit of our description, but in the, like to be a Jewish state, to have a Jewish state in the land of Israel, well, which bit or bits of the land of Israel? What do we mean by the land of Israel? Now, as was given to the British in the mandate in, in the 1920s, we're talking about the bit of land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River, but between those two bits of land, it is not clear, or Zionism has no single answer for which bits of those should be Israel. And the conversations at the moment about annexation or no annexation, whatever, are essentially just further conversations about that exact question. If we were to go back, let's say 70 years to the 1930s, there were profound questions in the Zionist movement about whether or not to even in principle accept the principle of partition, i.e. that there should be a Jewish state and an Arab state. And in the early, like in the 30s and the 40s, at least in principle, the Zionist movement accepted that, um, a, a, that concept. And um, today there are some within the Zionist movement who reject that concept, who say Israel should apply its sovereignty everywhere. Now, again, I'm not gonna get into the rights and the wrongs of the whole thing, that's for you and your own politics. But the point I'm making is that, again, within Israel and between Israelis and Palestinians, the conflict, if you like, one way to understand it is at least within the Zionist community, it's still an argument about which bits of the land of Israel should a Jewish state be established on or should Israel continue to control. So I want to just make two, two other brief points and then I am gonna, I'm gonna finish because I really want to get to the questions. The first is like, well, why was Zionism, like how did Zionism emerge and why was it attractive? I mean, essentially, in, we're talking about the period in the modern Zionism emerged in the 19th century. It emerged in a European reality where post enlightenment, as famously was said, you know, the, in the French Revolution, to the Jews as individuals, everything, to the Jews as a nation, nothing. Jews as individual citizens of their country were granted, at least in theory, equality. But there was no recognition of the Jewish collective, even though Jews have conceived of ourselves as a people, Am Yisrael, the people of Israel, even if we've been dispersed globally since time immemorial. That's one of the key elements of Judaism is it sees itself as a people. And in that reality, number one, there were people who said only when Jews could be clustered together in sufficient numbers, can, they, can we live in our ancient homeland? Can we have deter, like self-determination, you know, ability to self-rule, ability to control our own fate? Can we arrange the calendar according to the Jewish calendar? Can we speak Hebrew one to another? All of that stuff. Can Judaism truly flourish and thrive? That's, if you like, the positive optimism of Zionism, that Zionism and the establishment of the state would lead to a flourishing of Jewish, the Jewish soul, if you like. And secondly, that within that reality in the 19th century, it turned out that anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish hatred was far from being defeated on the increase to the extent that in the early 20th century, Zionists essentially said, one day not so far in the not so far future, maybe Europe will, will essentially expel its Jews. Like in the Middle Ages, when different countries expelled their Jews, they just couldn't, couldn't cope with the Jews anymore. They'd vomit them out. Now, again, in the early 20th century, I'm not sure anyone could have predicted in the way that it came about something like the Holocaust. But, and, 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 and it's very important to say, Zionism existed long before the Holocaust, and all of the positive stuff I just talked about, about the rejuvenation of the Jewish soul, that's an important stream of Zionism. Zionism is not only about a rejection and a protection from anti-Semitism, but nonetheless, the experience of the 19th and the 20th century was formative for many Jews, where they said, the truth is, not only did Europe, and, and Germany specifically, and the countries of Eastern Europe, vomit out and in fact exterminate their Jews, they couldn't imagine, they tried to create a Jew-free world, but also the other nations of the world essentially shut their doors to Jewish refugeehood. So very famously, in the town of Evian in France in 1938, the only country in the world that agreed to take uh, Jewish refugees in any great number was the Dominican Republic. And 
frankly, I have to say, and I, again, I don't want to make a political point here, but I'll make a little one. One of the things that I despair about when I've seen over the last five or 10 years, the, uh, the refugee crises emerging from Syria and other places is that same idea that the rest of the world has no space for some people. Now, whether or not you agree with me on that, in the third, like the experience of the 30s for Jews convinced Jews that at the end of the day, there has to be somewhere that we can go, not only to be at home in our own language, in our own culture, and in a majority um, uh, position, and using and uh, you know governing in self-determination, but also somewhere that will always be able to take us. And that's why a critical element of Israel today and the Zionist movement was the establishment of what's called the law of return, which guarantees any Jew who wants to citizenship of Israel if they choose to go. So it's that combination of the, the optimism of Zionism about its rejuvenation of the Jewish soul and the pessimism, which tragically turned out to be reality of Zionism, that Jews would need somewhere to flee to, that I think leads to why many Jews then, and still the vast majority of Jews today, see the existence of the State of Israel not as a nice to have, but as a necessity. And just the very, very last thing I want to share with you is a line from uh, an, one of the early Zionists, which resonates for me. His name was Leon Pinsker. Oh, Mel, I think you just need to stick yourself on mute. Thank you. Um, his name was Leon Pinsker. He, he died long before the establishment of the state. He was, uh, he was in his 60s in 1882 when he wrote these words. He was one of the early Zionists. He wrote a book called Auto Emancipation, where he basically said, Zionism is about the Jews not waiting for the world to help us, but helping ourselves, emancipating and liberating ourselves. And he says at the very end of the book, he said, help yourselves and God will help you. And what he meant by that is not um, it, what he meant by that is that traditionally, many people, certainly more religious people, might have inverted that. God will save us, and we'll wait for that to happen. And he said, no, God helps those who help themselves. And for the Jews, the way to help ourselves was through the great project of the 20th century of returning to the Jewish, you know, the historic homeland of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, rebuilding a national culture eventually founding a state and today, you know, the, the, that state flourishes. So that's something about Zionism then, Zionism now. Again, I'm sure like Sana, we're happy to take any and all questions that you have. Robin and Sana, thank you both very much um, for very erudite presentations and um, sort of pretty much sticking to time as well on very difficult topics to stick to time on, I think. Um, but it's, been, it's given us a very good introduction. There are a few questions that had been um, sort of communicated, even though the chat function isn't working for some reason. I have no idea why I've tried checking it out and I apologize. Um, so if there is anything else, um, any other questions, we'll ask a couple of the ones that have been asked so far. Um, and then if you want to um, either indicate using your sort of um, waving your hand through the reactions button at the bottom of the page, or you could try waving like that. But as we're on two screens, I can't promise we'll see everyone straight away, but we'll, we'll try and keep an eye out for, for everyone. Um, some of the questions that have um, come in so far, uh, I think I'll sort of start with one from Frank, um, or one of the Franks who's on today, Frank Adam, um, who asked, what are the possibilities of much relaxed tensions with the passing from the scene of Bibi and Abbas, besides the Assads and the Ayatollahs, as he says. Um, it's moving on slightly from some of the things you've said so far, but I'm um, very much uh, putting us in the, in, in the current um, situation. Uh, are you both you happy to say a few words on that? Sana, you want to start? Yeah, I, I don't mind. What, what do you want to do? You, you're yeah. unmuted. You might as well go first. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, so I think that uh, we are in many ways in the, the second generation of leadership, both for Israel and for, like, Israelis and for Palestinians. 
you know, in Israel, there was a first generation of Ben Gurion and Begin and Golda Meir and that generation who have now died. Um, and they have handed over to a, you know, a new generation of Ehud Barak and Bibi and, and their, their ilk. And the truth is that the time of Bibi will come to an end at some point. He'll lose an election or he'll step down or, or who knows, at least in theory at the moment, he's meant to rotate out of government. Do, do, do I think that that and similarly with, with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who is really only the second national leader of the Palestinian people since the foundation of the PLO uh, after, after Yasser Arafat, do I think that those two figures are, you know, the things that are, are they're passing or their generation moving on is going to change everything? I have to say here I'm a little bit more of a structuralist. I don't really believe in the, uh, the great man theory of history. And I do emphasize man because it's never great women who, when people talk about these things. Yes, of course, individuals set the tone, provide leadership, make decisions, lead their people. But overwhelmingly, it's far greater and wider structural factors that affect why tensions in Israelis and Palestinians or why there's no resolution to the conflict. The conflict would not be resolved tomorrow if Bibi and Abbas went and someone else was in there, I don't think. I think it requires much broader constituencies on both sides to come to some sort of agreement, uh, you know, to, to, to work out what future they would like to see. I do think that for many um, Israelis, Abbas, for whatever reason, is seen as a problem, not a partner for peace. They, they cite some of the things he's written in the past, that he's old school, that he's corrupt. And probably Palestinians would say some of the same things. I think for some Palestinians, Bibi is like the embodiment of intransigency and, and inability to, um, you know, to, to see a future, to maintain a status quo, or to make things get worse. But do I think automatically if they moved on, things would improve? Um, if you think, by the way, that the things are bad at the moment, which not everybody does, but let's assume that you do, uh, then no, I don't think that. I think it's broader structural things that will have to happen in both societies and perhaps in the, the broader world. Thanks, Sana. So my answer is that on that, um, the fact that the the leaders are going to go at some point and then we have new leadership, I do agree with Robin, that's not going to resolve everything. Um, I, what worries me, if we have a leader re-elected again and again, despite being divisive and, uh, and racist, uh, in the case of Benjamin Netanyahu, I ask myself the question about why do people still vote for him? And that's what worries me more, is the people voting for such a person rather than uh, uh, only him being there for, uh, uh, and having those policies that, have, that do not engage with the, um, the negotiations, with negotiations with the Palestinians. And now there is the leadership level and there's the people to people. So I do think that both on the civil society level, the Palestinians and the Israelis are doing a lot, are involved. There are a lot of initiatives that are preparing all of us for the day post the conflict, after we resolve it, and that we are trying very hard to build the trust and, and to think about, kind of get ready for um, the, the time we resolve the conflict. But that in itself is not enough. That the, the Bottom up is important, but the top down has to come uh, parallel to that so we can really have a resolution. Um, with regard to Abbas being a partner or not, as perceived on the Israeli public, I think uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, Abu Mazen, made one of his, I, I call it the suicidal speech that he has given when we had uh, the, uh, the um, um, socioeconomic demonstrations against the socioeconomic situation in Israel a few years uh, back, I think it was 2015, uh, when people went down out to the streets and put the tents, we call it in Hebrew, the Mecha'ah Hebratit. He gave a speech about not wanting to go back to his hometown, Safad, uh, Tzfat. And back then, Israel, the Israeli government elections were all busy about the economic and social issues, and nobody even picked up on what uh, Mahmoud Abbas said. And in his speech, he kind of hinted that he kind of not a, as strict as they think about the right of return uh, of all Palestinian refugees, and it costed him a lot of uh, a lot on 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 the Palestinian side, and and was not picked up. 
I'm not saying that he all is good on the Palestinian side and only we need to fix it on the Israeli side. I, I probably believe a younger, genera a younger generation of leader, leaders and leadership is going to do good. But in the meanwhile, I think there have been more signs of Abu Mazen wanting to, be, uh, to go for peace negotiations than he is uh, perceived or portrayed by the Israeli side. Benjamin Netanyahu, I don't think I need to add more, um, too much. I think uh, he speaks for himself uh, with his corruption and, and divisiveness, even within Israel as an Israeli citizen. I'm so, I'm so waiting for the day he just leaves politics and leave us all to re rebuild what he has destroyed. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Um, I've had the book. Thank both of you. Um, now, the question comes coming from Melvin. Um, after the Y agreement, the Palestinians agreed to withdraw the parts of the PNC charter that referenced the elimination of Zionist presence in historic Palestine. How then can the Palestinians leg legitimately form a state without renouncing these demands? I've heard this question so asked often. Um, do you think that's a relevant question? And uh, what else do you have to say in terms of the, the answer? Um, Sam, do you want to go first for that I'm one? not sure the PNC still have the... the ex I, I'm not sure. I need to check if they do have... I don't believe that the Palestinian Authority, as one ha who has been engaged with negotiations with Israel and recognized, and the PLO recognizing Israel as a state in 1988, I don't think... Uh, Israel would have sat to the negotiations table if, if there's still such an article. I need to check if, if it's still there. I don't believe it's there. Even more than that, Hamas has changed its, its charter uh, about two years back, I think, uh, to exactly that part that was anti-Semitic and, and denying uh, 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 the, uh, the, the right of Israel to exist. Even that was, uh, was changed on the Hamas uh, side. So I would like to say what, one thing about, uh, because I do often hear about, oh, Al-Mufti, I mean, Hosseini went to meet Hitler, or oh, Abu Mazen wrote in his dissertation something of this and this. You know, Itaq Rabin said that we should, we should break the skulls and the bones of the Palestinians. And then he went and signed the, the peace agreement, the Oslo peace agreement. Do I need, do I pick up uh, that, that, that sentence of Rabin, and I keep mentioning it every time we discuss a possible resolution? Do I stick to fears? Do I choose fears and, and, and reinforcing fears? Or do I choose a hope and look at the future? So no, none, none, none side, no leader on any side is an angel. And yes, people need to play a very hard game of legitimacy of talking to their own people and talking to the other side. If Abu Mazen talks only what the Israeli sides want to hear, He's going to lose legitimacy back home in Palestine, and he's not going to be the legitimate leader that you want to speak to. And if he speaks only to his people, then the Israeli side is, oh, he's not a partner for peace. We cannot, we cannot sit with him for, for negotiations. So it's, we need to bear in mind, it's a very delicate um, game of legitimacy for leaders. And uh, I wouldn't say we should pick only on one statement by one leader and then just reinforce our fears on either side. Thanks, Anna. Robin, do you want to comment on that? I'll, I'll just make a, a short comment. So I, I don't know the specifics of when, uh, you know, a side said they would and if they actually did and when it actually happened, change uh, documents uh, and so on. Uh, of course, you know, these kind of symbolic acts are very, very important in building trust and in changing realities. But, uh, and, and whether or not it's happened, I'm not exactly sure. Again, like Sana, I'd have to look at precisely. I think, though, that the perception piece is very, very important. I think that for many Israelis, Israeli Jews, to be clear, they have a very deep fear that fundamentally for many Palestinians, whether this is fair or not, they have a deep fear for many Palestinians, um, there is no fundamental legitimacy to Zionism. That at the end of the day, yes, Israel exists and is there and does its thing, and that's fine, it's a state in the world, um, but that fundamentally it's a kind of illegitimate presence and, um, you know, you hear and it's kind of almost become a meme, as you see, you know, the, the, the more absurd element of this where Palestinians, the very few to be clear, but some won't even talk about Israel. They'll say the Zionist entity and things like that. And the idea there, I think, is meant to be, you know, we're just going to, if by calling it something different, we're going to kind of pretend it, it doesn't exist or it won't exist soon. And I mean, you know, the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict exists for many reasons and is, has been going on for over 100 years for many reasons. But one fundamental, like one analysis of it 
is that fundamentally it is actually it's not the 1967 question or the 1948 question it's the 1881 question by which i mean fundamentally um, the moment that Jews said we are returning en masse to, our, to what we consider to be our homeland, when we are going to not colonize in historic Palestine or the land of Israel or Palestine, whatever you want to call it, we are returning there as essentially we've just waited an awful long time. We've had 2000 years of refugeehood and now we're coming back and we're coming home and we're rebuilding our national life. You know, that's, that was their understanding in the 1880s. For many uh, Palestinians then and now, that fundamentally was not return and was not um, rebuilding of a national life. It was colonialism of some kind. Now, again, I, as a Zionist, I don't believe it's colonialism, but I fully accept some people do. And I'm not going to get into an argument about whether it was or it wasn't. But my point simply is that fundamentally, I do think there is a concern amongst many Israeli Jews and Zionists around the world that um, there is a lack of appreciation for the fundamental legitimacy of the Zionist cause. It's one reason why, rightly or wrongly, in the last kind of 10 years, or 15 years now, or, or 10 years really, of negotiations over a possible two-state solution, whether they will continue in the future, who knows, Israel has made this additional demand that the Palestinians kind of sign on to, the idea that they would recognize not just Israel, but Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, or as a Jewish state, however you want to phrase it many Palestinians that's an unacceptable demand it's chucking away their own history and so on and so forth but that's where that demand comes from it's the idea that until there's a fundamental understanding that we as a Jewish people have a, a right as you know to return to our land and we're not here as some kind of European colonialist project we're actually here as refugees returning home to our historic homeland until there's that understanding then kind of the conflict will never be solved. You may agree or disagree with that as an analysis, but I do think that is a significant current within how many Israeli Jews and other Zionists think or understand the conflict. Thank you both. Uh, next question from Hedva, which I think is uh, possibly more related to Sano, as it was uh, something one of the um, parts of your presentation that we saw on the screen. Um, can you explain the Hebrew writing on the pre-1948 currency in the image that you showed? I don't know if you remember what it was. <laughs> no, I also asked my, myself that question, how come? Because uh, the one I showed, it was Arabic, by the way. It was Jnei Falastini. But I've seen other pictures where you had Hebrew early on, and I was wondering to myself who allowed it and how did it come about? Uh, I didn't research that part, but the one I showed you, it was in Arabic, Jnei Palestini, that was the, the, the currency uh, after the uh, Ottoman uh, uh, lira. Yes, Frank, I think, wants to say something, maybe. You need to unmute him. You need to unmute, Anyone? Frank, but there are other questions as to come as well. I think uh, I think uh, an admin has to unmute. From... Yes. Oh, there we go. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, the the answer to that one is very simple. Uh, when the British arrived in Palestine, it was still occupied enemy territory administration south, and they brought with them Egyptian pound notes, which they used. Uh, Samuel, as high commissioner, uh, commissioned a Palestine note. And uh, because it had already been agreed that uh, Arabic and Hebrew and uh, uh, English would be three equal uh, official languages, the notes and the stamps, and I still have some mandatory stamps in my collection, uh, were written in the three languages. If you look very carefully after the Palestine, you will see in brackets an Aleph Yud for Eretz Israel. Um, that at the time was a bit of a squabble. And that explains why there's Hebrew, Arabic, and English on all Palestine documents. And my father, who was in the country 25 to 30, said that his architectural documents, when put up uh, planning permission, had to equally be written uh, or coded or whatever in the three languages. Thank, Thank you, for Frank. That. Brilliant. OK. Um, next question. Can I ask Salma to unmute and ask your question, please? Salam and shalom to all you lovely people. Um, it's been really interesting actually listening to all of this. I wanted to kind of make a, a few points um, and also just to kind of um, ask maybe a question will come from it. 
Um, Robin, you mentioned about the refugees during, um, well, after the World War. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that the UK accepted about 10,000 refugee children on the kinder transport. So, you know, UK has a very good history of taking on and looking after refugees from all over the world. So I just wanted to kind of bring that to your attention. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say as well is that I'm a firm, one second, I'm just gonna close my door. Sorry about that. Um, in terms of, um, I think Sana um, was mentioning the um, Israeli prime minister uh, as, as racist. Um, Trump, I mean, in my opinion, I can't speak for anybody else. I can only speak for myself. You know, um, Donald Trump, president of the United States, is a racist and he was voted and is now president. Boris Johnson, in my opinion, is a racist person, but he's also been voted in and he is obviously now our prime minister. So I do honestly believe and I have a lot of hope and I have a lot of um, admiration for the young people, the young Muslims and the young Jewish um, people in um, where, where they are living at the moment in the conflict areas because I do believe that they want to live in peace and the way that they're going to live in peace is to vote in leaders who also want to live in peace and by peace I mean equally so equal homes equal access to you know to the health service equal access to employment equal access to you know, living space, all of that. And I really do believe that the, it's going to be down to the people. And for the people, I am really emphasising here the young Muslims and the young Jewish people who are living there at the moment. So my question, I think the question I think that comes from that is, is how do you feel um, about the, the young Jewish and the young Muslim people and what are the what is happening on the ground now um, that is going mm. to help the young Jewish and the young Muslim people to join forces and to elect peaceful leaders on both sides thank you I've had any young Christians as well Yes, good point, Salma. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say something quickly. Um, again, one, I'll, I'll... one of the points. Sorry, one of the points. Sorry, go for it. Sorry, sorry, Robin. You mentioned about what happened, and it was obviously absolutely horrific what happened to the Jewish people in Germany. But they also did um, get rid of um, the black people and the gypsies and the um, and all sorts of other people that were not a particular group of people. So I just wanted to make that point as well but I totally agree it's horrific and wrong what happened to the Jewish community during the second world war thank you sure and and again like I, I'm not really interested in the oppression Olympics one people suffering doesn't necessarily trump or anything like that anybody else is a hundred percent and uh, I agree with you I just wanted to pick up on what you're saying about the younger generation so you know I I Maybe I'm, I, I'm not sure I fully believe what I'm about to say, but maybe I'm just going to say it because just given different perspective from the kind of optimism that Sana had, let me give a slight bit of pessimism perhaps um, <laughs> about the younger generation, not because I don't love young people, my career has been working with them. But in terms of young Israelis and young Palestinians, um, let's, it, let's talk about them, let's leave aside people living outside of uh, the region. And um, survey after survey shows that young Israelis are um, more right-wing than their parents and their grandparents um, for a whole host of reasons, some of which are demographic. A high percentage of them tend to come from religious homes, uh, religious Jewish homes, who tend to have more right-wing politics, again, with exceptions, but that's the, the trend. Uh, but also, you know, for many young Israelis, um, they, they, they've never known a time of serious negotiation. And from their perspective, the times when there has been serious negotiation has only ever led to further conflict and violence. So they've, many of them, don't see, they don't see a kind of glorious, uh, uh, you know, hand in hand future we're going to walk towards. Of course, there are many who do, but actually, um, if, you're, if you're hope, if you think that the, what you would like Israelis to be is, if you like, quote unquote, more left wing, uh, at least on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, at the moment, uh, the younger generation are not, are not moving in that direction. 
And I think that, and Sana will correct me here, both on Israelis and Palestinians, she's more of an expert being both a citizen of Israel and a Palestinian. Um, but for many young Palestinians, I think that um, they see their leadership as corrupt. They see this idea of the two-state solution as a lovely idea in theory, but in practice kind of like hasn't happened. And uh, they see a, a continued dispossession and occupation and whatever other ills they consider Israel to be imposing on them. Um, and many of them are probably a bit despairing, like, you know, it's this, this negotiation thing was a nice idea in theory, but who are we going to negotiate with in practice? Um, again, I don't want to be pessimistic for the sake of being pessimistic, but I think it's important to understand that if we just pin our hopes on young people will come through and be universal and march forward on the path to peace, I think there's real work that has to be done in both societies in order for that to, uh, in order for that to be our future, rather than one where the new generation sees the conflict actually in some ways is more challenging to solve even than their parents did. So I, I, I do agree with Robin that with you Robin that there is a lot of work to do but what I see in the in the Israeli society within uh, the Israeli society which uh, I'm referring both to the young Jews and the young Palestinian citizens of Israel I think there is a, um, a rising awareness about how about moral issues, about the the the, the occupation being the core question, uh, about the situation being non-sustainable anymore. I think, and even it goes as far as to speaking about the Nakba on the Nakba Memorial, something that I haven't seen as much uh, in 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 previous years but for example in the last two years the way my jewish friends write about the nakba which is the catastrophe in english uh, referring to 1948 uh, it's there's more acknowledgement there's more awareness there's now a movement called uh, standing together it's arab jewish joint movement that we're hoping that becomes a political party that runs for the knesset the parliament um I do think, however, that the fear psychology, and I agree with you that some, I mean, the Israeli, with, with, that, with that awareness also, the, the Israeli society as a whole, in general, has shifted right in its voting and in, in its political um, uh, standing. So, and, and that's where I think Benjamin Netanyahu has played a major role in provoking fears, uh, having, knowing that the fear psychology is there, for the Jewish people and saying always, you know, the Iranian threat, the Arab threat, or they are gonna, they wanna wipe us off the map. And even us, the Palestinians, he succeeded with us, the Palestinian citizens of Israel to make an enemy out of us and to call our representative in the Knesset, representatives as, as terrorists. And that's, that's a success for him, but that worries me. What we can do on the ground, and I think our Knesset members also are doing it, uh, the Arab Knesset members are doing a good job in that, um, is to, to say out clear that we want to integrate in the political game in Israel and we want to, even we are ready to sit in a center left leaning government, which Ayman Audi, the head of the joint list said, said in the last elections. Uh, I think that is, that is a, a good sign. Um, with regard to what the Palestinians perceive of the Palestinian leadership, yes, there is um, um, a despair and discontent about corruption. Uh, and more than that, there is despair about the, the um, security cooperation with Israel. The Palestinian Authority is seen as a, a, an, an agency to which Israel has outsourced its uh, uh, chasing the young Palestinians who oppose the occupation, uh, trying to give information to Israel about who's active where. In that sense, actually, that has harmed the, the status of the Palestinian Authority more than anything. But definitely corruption is another issue that uh, should enhance uh, even a, a stronger Palestinian inner discussion. Um, they, the bottom line is we have a lot of work to do, but still I, I do think that what we are trying to do within Israel, the Palestinian citizens of Israel with our Jewish partners and friends by creating partnerships or movements or leading in, in civil society, but also trying to influence politics, I think that's the way out. Uh, and that the problem is it takes time um, to, to change the perception of a people, of how each side sees the other, and we are all I mean, the majority of us want uh, 
uh, two state solution or peace and 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 not uh, and within 72 years but within the coming two years so yes there's a lot of work to do i agree on that inshallah please god yes um uh let's take lucille's question i can see more questions coming um i was going to take lucille uh, Osama and Bernard, um, I see I must just added a hand and there's two others, but um, and I did want to try and end in eight minutes, um, but we'll see how we go. Um, some of them had to go, but a couple have joined us. Lucille, please. I was listening to a lecture by Yossi Klein Halevi, a famous Israeli journalist this morning, whom you all know, and he has written a book which has also been translated into Arabic uh, regarding the Zionist narrative and he's looking for a dialogue with Palestinian Arabs and um, he thinks that one of the major problems is that is something that Robin's already touched on which is that the uh, Palestinian Arabs totally deny the Zionist narrative the Jewish narrative that Israel Israel's centrality to Judaism and Jewish life and the fact that Jews are, are not only returning, but have had a presence here all the time. Now, uh, Jews tend to be more willing to bend over backwards and accept certain aspects of the Palestinian narrative, but I don't see much acceptance of the Jewish-Israeli narrative. Ha Do you think there will be a time when the sides can accept each other's narratives and then work forward from that somehow? Can I say very, very quickly? First of all, I would always, always just let's not, um, just as we shouldn't uh, cast any people as homogenous, you know, that saying all Palestinians or all Israelis think one thing, of course, is not not entirely true. But I think it's fair to say the like the majority position is is uh, at least not an un uncritical acceptance of the Zionist narrative amongst Palestinians. I think that's true. Well, I think what I would say the Palestinian leadership in meetings. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. But then let's use the words Palestinian leadership. Let's just be careful with how we uh, inadvertently okay. ask people out. So all I was going to say was, I think that there's that there's a big debate within the kind of peacemaking world um, between two completely diametrically opposed positions. One says history, identity, narrative are the most important things. We need to do the hard work to understand our own, understand the other, try and create shared narratives, try and create respect, um, try and really understand the pain that each side has felt, all of this kind of thing, and that will lead us towards, uh, you know, peace. And there's another people, there's another group of people who say, no, like, there's the road to perdition. Those are the intangibles. Those are the impossible to solve. Those are where you ask people to give up on something fundamental to themselves, which they'll never give up on. Um, and really what you should do, like, peace is not about shared narrative. Peace is the opposite. Peace is a technical um, process to allow both sides to detach themselves from having to kind of internalize the other, uh, other side's narrative. Now, you can be on either side of that debate, but I think it's important to recognize that both sides are there. And again, I just want to sound one note of caution. I spent some time five years ago in Bosnia. And, and in Bosnia, you have, it's even more complicated, arguably, than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You've got dozens or, or certainly you know seven or eight different ethnic groups of different understandings uh, their war came to an end in 1995 because essentially the west imposed a solution at dayton their conflict has not ended because the peoples fundamentally reject each other's understanding not even only of history but also of the present day and uh, I think it's particularly relevant and poignant as we are uh, 25 years on almost to the day of the Srebrenica massacre that even if there is some accommodation, some kind of peace, I would not hold out much hope for fundamentally the two sides at a very, very deep level coming to accept or acknowledge or, or come together on narrative. Uh, that's my view. Thank you for that optimistic answer there. <laughs> no, you're, you're completely right. Sign up, please. Yeah, in short, um, um, Lucille, um, the Palestinian leadership recognized Israel in 1988 and then signed the Oslo Accords in 1993. So the recognition of Israel as a state uh, has been recognized already. And the Palestinians would wonder why are they again and again asked for recognition that they have given? Uh, and the, what, what, um, 
what Robin said earlier about, yes, there was early on, there was denial of the Zionist narrative and the, the and Israel was referred to as the Zionist entity, al Khan Sahyuni, um, as a, a way to deny its right to be. Um, but one also should remember and understand the psychological process on the Palestinian side. Like one day before you had the whole land and then the next day you will have the Nakba and you need to share it with another people. It's not a, 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 um, um, a natural uh, a, and they, an, an organic process for all people that they would give their own land and just share it with another. That's not to, to deny anything of, of, uh, of the other narrative on, on you know, uh, belonging or feeling for the, the, or connection to the land. But um, I, I'm, my question is why after, after the, the Palestinian leadership has recognized Israel as a state on, on official negotiations and agreement signed, why is it still the question if you say the recognition that way or that way, and, and that worries me at times about how much terminology becomes actually a barrier and becomes a condition. And, and, and we, we are still in kind of being made busy of saying it the way the Israeli leadership wants to hear it, uh, while it has already been done in 1988. Why, why, why is this question coming now? I mean, the, the bigger question, why is there no Palestinian state still? Why is there still occupation even after negotiations and signing an agreement? And that's what you would get from the Palestinian side. Thank you, Sana. Yes, possibly more questions to um, ask than um, there are. But, uh, I think Osama Hassan was, was waiting for yeah, very long. I was say, we have three questions and three, that's just under three minutes now. Um, if you need to leave, um, I, so I'm sorry to see you go, but we fully understand. But I think we might try and take these three questions. Um, if we can ask them briefly and maybe answer them briefly. But uh, uh, we will so give you information about the next FODIP seminar, even though this is the third of a series of three. There is another seminar planned for the future in two weeks time. Um, but so we'll so give you that afterwards. So Sama, could I ask you please to um, ask your question? Yeah, thank you, everyone, and, and shalom, salam, and, and peace greetings. Um, and I speak as uh, uh, one of the founding patrons of the organization, which I'm honored to do for, for three years. Uh, I'm sorry I missed half of this session because I was on another Zoom call, you know what it's like nowadays. Um, I have a very quick question, which I'm actually not expecting to be answered now because it's, it's a long one. But if we could perhaps address in a future seminar. Um, and if I could suggest if we take the, the three remaining questions at once and then leave the floor to the speakers. So thank you for the speakers. I really enjoyed what you said. And my question is really to Robin mainly and to other Jewish colleagues and theologians really. It's a question I've asked many rabbis and Jewish friends. It's a theological question because I do a lot of interfaith work uh, as an imam and I've written a book on this. And I've never received an answer to this, which I think is it's kind of fundamental. Uh, because you see in the Quran, we have a chapter, one of the chapters of the Quran is called the children of Israel. We have a lot about the whole history of Bani Israel uh, in the Quran itself. Um, and, and my understanding is, of course, it's the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, you know, the Quranic commentaries are full of this. And uh, modern Jews, of course, all, all the modern Jewish friends that I know tell me that modern Jews represent two of those uh, 12 tribes. And, uh, and, and my question is, uh, which I think is fundamental, is that, uh, you know, we understand only those two tribes have kept up the Jewish tradition, you know, that's very clear, who are practicing Jews, basically. But in principle, if, if, according to the Zionist or Jewish narrative, if the entire land belongs to the 12 tribes of Israel, who Muslim, the Muslims revere, by the way, uh, and the patriarchs, Abraham, Jacob, etc., Israel, um, then what happened to the, the right of the other 10 tribes, which according to my understanding, most of them became the Christian and Muslims of the Middle East. Uh, you know, I've had a former head of Mossad who agreed with me on this, and he said, the, the Palestinians are basically Semites and we should have converted them all to Judaism at the beginning of Israel and given them all equal citizenship, you know. That was, that was his answer. Genetic studies have shown that, that Arabs and Palestinians now, uh, sorry, Palestinians and Jews in the Middle East are, are basically the, the, the same race. And some people have tried to, to suppress those scientific genetic studies uh, because of course the cultures are very different, that's very clear especially among, between Jews and Muslims and Christians. But I, I think this is a fundamental issue, actually, which 
Uh, and, and I would just encourage that we need more people to people, building of friendship and, and kind of warmth, et, et cetera, but also tackling these difficult questions as FODIP and many other organizations are doing and the two of you. But I, I would love to have a discussion and have that question answered. I'm sorry to ask such a long question. Thank you. No, I think it's an important one and I think we should definitely have a session on it. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. could answer a lot of that question, but uh, I won't at the moment. Yeah. Because it's Correct, you won't at the moment. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to at the moment either. Um, but I sincerely hope of some, you know, advocating forced conversion of the Palestinians. Um, that's taking us back to, um, to the, the book of Joshua in the Bible, and I really don't think we want to go there. Um, but yeah, it's, there are lots of issues around that, and I think those are some of the areas we can explore as a continuation possibly from this. So thank you for that. So let's um, engage with that and see how we can uh, sort of follow that up, because there are lots of issues and questions in there. Bernard, please, can we hear, have your question? Thank you. Um, as, as both a supporter of Zionism and the pa Palestinian uh, self-determination, um, I have two, two questions. The one is, is the political realignment in the Middle East um, necessarily going to diminish the pa Palestinian voice until such time as it um, uh, uh, fades away to some extent? And my second question is, what do we mean by Palestinian? Are we talking about West Bank and Gaza? I get the sense that when people are talking about Palestinian, they're really talking about Fatah, West Bank, and that Gaza is a completely diff different issue with different political, cultural, and religious implications for Israel. Just small, easy questions to answer, just as a yeah. short yeah. question. Yeah. 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 So Sana first, maybe, or, or Robin, you want to go in? I was just going to say, Warren, should we want to just take the last question and then maybe Sana and I can both answer whichever bits yes. of whichever questions. I'm just aware of time. Good idea. Oh, you're on mute. Sana, do you want to ask your question then, please, as well? Sorry, who was who did you ask to ask the question? You, uh, if you are, yeah, thank you. Me, all right, all right, just to make sure. Um, so mine is more of a statement rather than a question. So if you would like to answer the first question first, and I'll chip in at the end, your choice. Make, make yours quickly, and, and then our guest speakers can. Okay, so you were um, you were talking about. Um, so I'll answer, I'll answer part of the first question that um, the gentleman before me answered. Uh, asked and that was um, what, who are Palestinians? So Palestinians are spread out in the different countries that are surrounding Palestine or the state of Palestine or whatever you want to call it. And so there are Palestinians in Jordan and there are groups of us spread out in Egypt and everywhere and there are Palestinian refugees wherever you go within the Middle East. Um, so we are spread out but we still call ourselves Palestinians. So I'm a young Palestinian and my main, when I, I raised my hand when um, um, uh, the discussion was going on about um, young people and their effect and the hope that we have um, that everyone should have um, for young Palestinians and young Jewish people um, and I just wanted to make the statement that there is there is I find it very hard to compare um, how um, I find it very hard to compare the lives of both young Palestinians and young Jewish people and because of and the reason for that is the um, uh, the fact that we, that, let, let me just explain the um, situation in Palestine. So Palestine is a place where young people, as I think Sana said, um, have, uh, and um, Robin, I think as well. Um, Palestine is a place where young people don't see a future. Um, they don't have well-paid jobs and there is a high percentage of people who have finished university and stay at home for five to six to ten years. Um, doing absolutely nothing because there is uh, such a lack of jobs in Palestine. And so there is, um, there is a great gap. And in, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is a huge disparity in opportunities that young Palestinians and young Jewish people have. And so in order to actually compare, um, to create that hope and create that discussion between young Israel, young uh, Jewish people and young Palestinians, maybe the only solution is to bridge that gap because if one side looks at the other and sees that they have got everything while the other just sits there and says we've got 
um, this and this and this, but they've got this and this and this more than us, then they're going to feel weak. They're going to feel um, undertreated. And there's always going to be this sense of injustice. Um, and this is also going to play into the fact that um, uh, obviously Israel has occupied um, Palestine and it's now the um, Israel, whatever you want to call it, like whatever, if you're a, a Zionist, if you're a pure Palestinian, if you're wh whatever you want to call it, and I'm sure you know what I mean. Um, so I think for young Palestinians where you can't get a job, um, you can't for a period of 10 years after you've got 90% in your, in your university degree, uh, where you've been top of your class. Um, I know because I've got um, uh, uh, a cousin who got top of his class in university and he's in Palestine and he's been sitting at home for five years um, and he couldn't find a job. Because what's happening is that people, there, there, is, there is such a lack of jobs, such a lack of, of opportunities um, that people can't find a way out of their misery, out of their troubles, out of their uh, situation. And the only way that you could find a solution out of this is to either work in Israel which is what most people do. But at the same time, you've got this Palestinian identity, which says those people who work with Israel or like with, there is a sense in, the, in, in some Palestinians that um, the Palestinian authority is, um, uh, like, like, like Sana said, it advises people, it, it helps Israel in identifying um, uh, people that Israel might want uh, within Palestine that may be from Hamas or Fatah or any other group. So there is a sense of, um, belief that maybe the Palestinian where the Palestinian Authority is not trusted enough and um, they believe that um, uh, the Palestinian Authority is not representative of the Palestinian people and it's there to trick people and other whatnot so people when they try to find work they are mistreated by other Palestinians who say you are working with Israel against us or you are working um, against our Palestinian um, image that we had before um, obviously the occupation. Okay, um, rush you, Irma, please. Sorry? I'm going to have to rush you a bit because... Oh, of course, uh, of course. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a huge disparity between Palestinians and Israelis within the young generation. So when you talk about the young generation and there being hope, in my opinion, I don't think there is any hope because there is no change and there is this huge disparity where somebody feels weaker than the other and has less opportunities in life than the other and so they will never be at the same level to negotiate and to discuss with each other the steps in going forward with this conflict. And this conflict will keep continue and keep going for generations to come if the opportunities that young Palestinians and young Jewish people are not equal. And that is my Thanks. own point. Thanks, Amma. Sana, do you want to pick up after that, please? And then Robin yes. may finish. Yes, I'll say quickly. So you said you feel Palestinians are Fatah. No. Fatah is one uh, political party, uh, Hamas is another. Uh, the Palestinians are all the people in the diaspora and also within the West Bank, Gaza, and the, including the Palestinian citizens of Israel. I do apologize. Uh, I think you uh, misunderstood me. I do not believe that, that all not Palestinians you, it's are Bernard. Fatah. He's answering, I'm, I'm he's answering, answering Bernard. the other point. Oh, I just, the other question. I'm answering Bernard. So, um, 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 the Palestinian uh, Hamas was, as you know, uh, created after the Fatah has engaged in negotiations with Israel to say that if you're going through uh, diplomacy, we are going to hold the, the uh, um, right for armed resistance against the occupation. But there were, everybody is a, a part of the same uh, wider Palestinian nation. Um, uh, Hamas is ruling in, in, in uh, Gaza, for those who don't know, and Fatah in the West Bank. But what I want to say about it, you said the political realignment in the Middle East and how that could, could potentially diminish the Palestinian cause, definitely. So one of the things that sometimes uh, we, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, are told, oh, why don't you just be uh, loyal citizens and why don't you help us forge uh, relations with the Arab world? And there is a, a, a commitment and responsibility for our people that for, even for me as somebody who has a degree in diplomacy, if I want to be, I cannot be uh, uh, in the Israeli foreign office helping forge relations with UAE if the Palestinian cause is not resolved and if the, the, the occupation does not end. 
So I, I wouldn't like to be a tool to just to make things look good when they're not really resolved. I would like them resolved. Um, you said something about, um, I'll connect that to what Omar said about the young Palestinian. Yeah, there is despair. We, what we want is to change the status quo, not to keep it. We want to resolve it. We want to end the occupation. So for me, as, and that comes back to Lucille's question, for me, to, ha to, have the one, uh, to have the few million of Palestinians under siege in Gaza and having young people, as Omar said, being in despair to the level that uh, about a few weeks back, uh, young people committed suicide just because they didn't have money or have money to pay the university fees, that is not legitimate. It doesn't make it legitimate for one side to say, only if you make that recognition or that sentence or you make that statement, only then we can negotiate with you. There are lives of people. We are talking about lives of people. We're talking about basic human rights. We're talking about electricity, about houses. So it, it can't be that we, we only, we, we stay focused on the fears and that's not to, uh, uh, to dismiss the importance of fears, but we, you cannot just be focused on the fears on one side while the other side is not practicing basic freedoms of movement and, 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 and living, uh, basic living rights. Uh, so yes, I agree with Omar. A lot in my 16 years of, uh, of facilitation uh, of dialogue, I often saw the Jewish youngsters saying, let's talk about things, and the Palestinian youngsters saying, let's do something about it. But here, I disagree with you, Omar, on one thing. I did work with the young Jewish uh, leaders here in the UK, uh, leaders of youth movements, and that does give me hope because the, the, the discourse, the, the language, the awareness of justice and asking and the universal values they, they live by and how they are clear about uh, willing to, dis, to criticize Israel when it comes to wrongdoings or to uh, 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 problematic policies. They're clear about that and they don't uh, uh, turn a blind eye. I do think the hope is in the younger generation. And I do think those young Jews and, and young Palestinian diaspora as well, they understand that when they vote for the British government here, that their vote needs to not only set the, uh, how their life is gonna look like here, but rather the foreign policy of the UK towards the Middle East, which is uh, important for all of us. So I do think still the younger generation is, is the hope and I am optimistic about the younger generation, even though the whole picture is, is pessimistic. Thanks, Anna. Robin, please. I mean, I'll just say one thing, kind of to kind of frame everything really for me. Um, you know, Zionism is an ideology uh, and was a program of political action um, that, uh, you know, did various things historically, founded the state, has animated uh, um, many Jews around the world and, of course, uh, many Jews in, in, in Israel um, to, to, to act. You know, Zionism was a philosophy of action, uh, an ideology of action. Um, it wasn't simply intellectuals imagining a future, it was people practically making a future. Uh, one of the reasons that I am a Zionist, one of the reasons that I became captivated by the idea of Zionism in my teenage years was precisely because it seemed to me to be um, an ideology which asked something of me, which said, if you're going to be a Zionist, then these are the things, you, these are the people you should be reading, these are the people you should be talking to, these are the problems you should be wrestling with, these are the this is the you're under how you should understand the world and things that you should do and you should you know some of them i've managed to do i'd like to think in my careers others like my long delay plan to learn hebrew properly are still works in progress and um, i would really encourage everybody whether you agree with the fundamental justice of the zionist cause whether you think it you or whether you don't whether you think that israel is broadly in the right or the palestinians are broadly in the right whether you think a two-state solution is the answer or a one state solution or a confederation, or you just don't know, to nonetheless kind of have two, again, almost opposite, but I think in a certain sense, complementary um, ways of being in the world. One is be action oriented, be inquisitory, learn about, engage, do whatever you're gonna do. And the second is have some humility because Sana is a citizen of Israel. But like she has a vote in the Knesset. She is a part of the Israeli body politic. She is like whether Israel is delighted about this or not, like is part of the future of Israel. 
She's currently in London, which I'm delighted about because I got to work with her for a year, but, but nonetheless, I'm not, I'm not. I might choose to be, but I'm not. And for those of us who are here in the UK, we just should have a little bit of humility that ultimately we don't live the lives of Israelis or Palestinians and we can learn about them and we can hear like Omar did, you know, testimony that, that, that where we hear either when things are good or when things are not good. Um, but as was said right at the beginning, let's not import the conflict here. Let's engage and discuss and have serious dialogue and have disagreement, but have some humility beyond the, uh, before the fact that at the end of the day, it is only Israelis and Palestinians who can determine the future of Israel and Palestine. Robin, thank you very, very much. That was a lovely way of ending it. Um, yeah, as you, you said, you framed, you were talking about framing things in various stages, and I think you framed that with what's, the way Sadia introduced the, um, the seminar and with what you and Sana have both said, the way you have um, fielded questions as well as um, the things you've said. Um, there are still various other questions that have been sent through, which some of which have been dealt with in one way or another, and a couple that we haven't got to. Um, but I think we've covered a lot of material. Um, we've identified many areas that still need clearly a lot of work on the ground in for Israelis and Palestinians, but also stuff that affects our communities here. And I think one of the, fo the focuses for FODIP very much is the relationship between us and our communities here in this country, and that we mustn't let what's going on there and the issues and the problems and the injustices and the lack of peace and the lack of friendship at times um, that actually needs to be addressed but we can actually talk about it here together as well and have to um, and we can hope and pray and suggest and encourage all sorts of solutions over there and work out ideas for ourselves but we're not the ones on the ground I'm sure Sana will be at some point going back and um, be on the ground there um, and we have met some wonderful people not just in this series of seminars been other things that um, FODIP have done, some of our study tours, some of the other things here. We work with the Tough Options program that Omar was part of one of them, and Sarah and Hedver and others who are on today who are, um, and Elazar who are part of, um, sort of the, the second one that's just, come, just, just finished. Um, we hope to continue to do some good and positive work and exploring how we can maintain positive relationships while disagreeing about things. None of us are saying we have to agree. Um, it'd be great if we could, but there are probably lots of things we have to work through. Um, so thank you all for being part of this series of three seminars. Thank you to Sadia and Jane for helping put it together. Um, to Robin and Sana for being stars for this third seminar, um, very much so. But also um, Greg and um, Akila and Danny from the other seminars. Um, this isn't the end of our lockdown series, well, our lockdown activity as FODIP. Um, in two weeks' time, um, we're actually fortunate to be able to welcome someone we have met through some of our FODIP study tours. Um, it's a Palestinian Christian, actually, the Holy Land Trust in Bethlehem. And they've offered to do a, um, a seminar for us looking at um, I suppose the perception and the work of Palestinian Christians in Bethlehem and what's going on for them. And I'm probably not building out or doing justice to um, what uh, Elias is going to do for us. But Elias Sami, who set up the Holy Land Trust, um, are inspirational in some of the work that they're doing and the way they're working for Palestinians with Israel, all sorts of things. So that's two weeks' time. Sadio will be sending you details. Um, thank you all for hanging on um, way beyond the end of the, um, the seminar, um, but thank you. Unmute yourselves if you want to talk for a couple of minutes before I log off this and have to go and join another meeting that started ages ago. Um, but again, thank you, Robin. Thank you, Sana. Thank you, thank Sergio you. Jane. And thank you all for being here and part of this with your questions, your inputs mm -hmm. and your emotional involvement. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. And thanks, Robin. Who's calling me? Yeah, me. It's Bernard. Bernard. Can, can I just? Do you have a couple of minutes just so that I extend my my question? Sure. Who's that? Okay. Yes. Bernard. Yeah, I asked a question about who the pa Palestinians are, and 
what I was trying to get at there was it seems that within the Middle East, there seems to be two very distinct forming groups, one in West Bank and one in Gaza. And if um, is Israel wants to have any negotiations with a Palestinian entity and for argument's sake, come to some agreement with Fatah, but with which Hamas doesn't agree, then what is going to be the disposition then for the identity of the group of people we've come to know as Palestinian? So I'm sorry to tell you that Israel is playing a very strange role in the divisiveness of the Palestinian side. And um, I do want to mention who I, I have one of the one of the advisors of one of the Israeli presidents told me directly. So he said, Sana, don't 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 be uh, don't get confused about it. We do want the, the uh, um, Hamas and Fatah to be divided. Uh, it's good for us. And um, if, you, if you may see recently when um, the head of the Israeli Mossad went to Qatar to ask for money for Hamas, at the mm -hmm. same time that Israel criticized Hamas, you ask yourself a question, how could that be? And what, what kind and how Israel, Qatar and Hamas are playing a role in keeping the status quo in Gaza? Now, um, that doesn't take away the responsibility of the internal Palestinian uh, unity that uh, discussion about unity that should be happening. But even when there was a uh, attempt for a national unity government a few years back, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, I remember, said, we, we, we do not, before there was a unity government, it's like, who are we going to talk to? When there was a unity government attempt, we cannot talk to you because Hamas is there. So mm. whatever the, is the Palestinian side does, it's criticized because it doesn't suit Israel. And you may ask a question if there is a genuine interest on the Israeli government side to sit down for negotiations or whatever the Palestinian side is going to do, there's always something else that Israel is going to pull as, oh, that's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, how that is going to define, it's not for Hamas and Fatah to define the Palestinian people and nation. The Palestinian nation is there before and after Hamas and Fatah. So that's not going to change the definition of who's a Palestinian. It's only the political leadership and, and the feeling of agency and who's capable to do what that might be reframed or needed, needs to be reframed if, let's say, Marwan Barwuti comes out of jail and Abu Mazen's not the leader anymore, if we have elections, if, if the Palestinian Authority holds elections or not. Those are the questions about the future political activity of either Fatih or Hamas or a national unity government. Uh, but it doesn't, this doesn't define who are Palestinians. So are you suggesting then that the divisions, that the political div divisions between Fatah and Hamas um, are, are, are not the determinants of Palestinian identity? And if that is the case, why don't Fatah and Hamas put aside the differences in the interests of Palestinian self-determination and hold elections across Thank you both very much. areas. So many Palestinians are asking exactly that question. If, you have an, if we have the answer, <laughs> we will <laughs> be in a better place. That's what many are trying to push for, of course. I mean, that's part of one of the reasons for the despair of the younger generation. Mm. We feel there's a bigger cause there is the, a bigger good for Palestinians. There is a bigger question. Uh, and it's not about um, uh, uh, the, the, the political dominance of Fatah and Hamas, but Fatah and Hamas don't see it that way. They see about how legitimate they are, who's going to be the, the, the dominant leadership in the, in the Palestinian, uh, of the Palestinian nation, who's the legitimate um, um, uh, representative if, if negotiation, negotiations happen. So mm. what the, the, the simple Palestinian person feels is different from what Fatah and Hamas feel about uh, coming together or staying separate or holding elections or not. So they don't really then have legitimacy. They do, yeah. but it's weakened. I mean, they are, I mean, both, 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 both 
sides, both Hamas and Fatah, their legitimacy is weakened because the people are not happy about what they're delivering. Mm. But the people are so busy with survival that there isn't the energy to go and, and, and uh, for an intifada or uprising. The people in Gaza, the situation is people are like really sad. I had a friend telling me people are so sad they don't even go and enjoy the sea, which is usually the, the main like uh, way to go and, and, and take your mind away from the reality, the harsh reality. Um, yeah, people are busy with survival and there's a feeling of despair. There's a feeling um, of weakness, of, um, of lack of leadership. Yeah. I, I, I just hope that within the three political ego structures of Fatah, Netanyahu, uh, and, and, and uh, sorry, Abu Mazen, Netanyahu, and Ismail Haniya, that somehow these people are all re removed and, you know, proper negotiations can happen. But as it stands now, I feel I'm more in Omar's camp where I, 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 I'm not as optimistic as you are. And I think that if something, uh, I need to use my words here carefully, if something critical doesn't change, then you'll have a, a, a dominance of a Netanyahu type ideology dominating simply because of lack of efficacy of any Palestinian ideology to stake its claim. I feel I'm accused of being optimistic, and I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I, I hope I hope I'm and and I'm are wrong, and that you are right, and I eat my hat. No, no problem. I am not optimistic about the general situation. I'm only optimistic about the younger generation and what they could bring, what we could bring. And uh, yes, I mean, if you don't, if we don't have a little bit of hope, I wonder how what, what we could do. But I. Yes, the general situation, I don't see a way out, uh, a, a breakthrough soon. Um, mm -hmm. But the younger generation is doing the right thing in, in demanding justice and demanding ending the occupation. And that's the source of hope for me. Thank you so Thank much. You all. I appreciate it. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of optimism. Hopefully we can um, be on the positive end. My glass is always half full. So, yeah. um, and please go to see many of you in two weeks' time um, when we... Welcome, Elias Deus of the Holy Land Trust. Again, thank you, Sana and Robin, who's had to leave. Um, thank you. See you all soon. God bless. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Sana. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.